Arun Sahani. I've been working here for 24 years. Can you use the video? The mic is. Cannot hear me. Not clear. Better now. Still not good. Nobody can hear me. Nobody can hear me. Can you hear me now? You can hear me. All right. So I work on many things, expanding universe and. Uh, Mysterious things like what is dark energy, what is dark matter, extra dimensions also. Maybe the universe has more than two dimensions, right? And formation of galaxies. So all this is actually encoded on this beautiful transparency where the universe began, we don't know how, in a big bang. And then as it evolved, it cooled, it was very hot out here. It cooled and then slowly galaxies began to form. And then the universe is out here somewhere today and it's beginning to accelerate faster and faster and faster. Maybe because of the presence of dark energy. So, you know, the universe today is pretty old. It's about maybe 30 billion years old. And we call it a middle-aged universe, right? And I'm a middle-aged scientist. Unlike Anurag who spoke before you, who's a very young scientist and kind of starting out on her career, tremendous enthusiasm which she communicated to all of you. And like the universe, I'm somewhere here, but all the beginnings go back here, all our inspirations. So let me tell you a little bit about my initial inspiration in science. So actually I was quite lucky, lucky and unlucky both ways. I went to school, boarding school in Malayas. And, and, and boarding schools uh, can be quite tough places, but in this case, the locale was very picturesque. And, and especially at night, the skies were really dark. So I liked it. Now, one of my first influences, you won't believe this, but was actually the Indo-Pakistan War of 1965. So you would say, why? What is a war to do with astronomy? <coughs> and what happened there was that, you see, the Pakistani Air Force had bombed Ambala. And my school was quite close there. It was in you know, the neighborhood of Shimla. And, and uh, the people got very panicky. And so our teachers used to come every afternoon, every evening, and do these air raid drills. You know, They have a mock air raid drill. And, and, and then they used to say, children, come out and lie in these drains, right? And put a hanky in your mouth and close your ears and lie down. You know, so that if a bomb goes off, you know, your, your teeth are safe, right? And so this was going on for a few weeks and we were all, you know, very kind of children. I was, I was just eight years old. We were very excited about this, what's going to happen. And one night, this air raid siren went off, right? And it was two in the morning, I think. And all of us children, we were in the dormitory, we ran out. And, and I remember still running out, it was very dark. And, and the teacher said, no, 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 no. Don't go to the drains, don't lie down. Look up. And I looked up. And there was this spectacular comet in the sky. And this comet was fantastic. To me, it filled the whole, the whole sky. And it was a very famous comet of 1965 called Comet Piasiki. I believe it's still the brightest comet that was ever seen this last century. So I think this is the first time that I felt that, you know, as a child you are playing around and you are playing football and hockey and your eyes are on the ground. This is the first time I lifted my head and said, wow, there is a whole wonder in the universe about me. This was my first really big inspiration. Later on, I started, I got a bit weak health there and my parents started to withdraw me and they said, okay, come back to Delhi. I'm a Delhi person, right? Go to school. But I, I had a bad, bad time because you know, my math teacher in, in, in this place, in the boarding school, was very bad and I started failing in math. And the math teacher in Delhi was a sadist. He used to beat us incessantly. I don't know why math teachers like to beat kids. <laughs> and they beat you also? I think it's very wrong. But, but because of these, uh, you know, uh, regular beatings, uh, my, my math started getting worse and worse and worse. I started failing in math. I remember my first exam, I got, I think, six out of 100 or something. <laughs> And because of that, you know, the teachers get very prejudiced very quickly. They say, this guy is certainly a dumb fellow, right, you know. But, you know, uh, curiously, although my marks were very mediocre, I loved 
I loved astronomy and I really wanted a telescope. So I told my father, you know, Papa, give me a telescope. Because, you know, there was a little shop there called Hobby Center in Delhi. And there was a lovely telescope, uh, you know, displayed. I got 100 rupees. There was a lot of money in 100 rupees, you know. And, and I said, give me this telescope. And my father said, Haan, bache, telescope to just room and dunga. To sell of 60 percent there. And I said, Papa, 60 percent, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, so uh, next uh, exams came, I studied very hard, about 52 percent. <laughs> then, uh, but I, I, Papa said to, le, 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 kar le. Uh, ek saal beat gaya, agle saal phir se try ki 54 percent aay. <laughs> My father kept looking at this, he said, bachche, ke, first gita to nahi aani, but telescope is a good thing. So my father gave me a telescope. <laughs> So now what happened, I got very excited, I had this telescope and you know, the next big occurrence was the second war. I mean, believe me, I don't like wars, but this happened. <laughs> <laughs> this was the end of the war of 1971. And the reason I mention it, again the skies in dark world, in, in Delhi were extremely dark. They were, they were, you know, fantastically dark because of blackout. And, and three Pakistani planes had actually been shot just in the outskirts of Delhi, so you know, population of Delhi was very nervous. And even if a little bit of light showed in your room, you had to be a fine. But for me, this was heaven because I could observe stars, and, and, and the night sky in Delhi was like in the Himalayas in those days. And so I, 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 I was enjoying looking at Jupiter, Saturn, uh, and I made my first really big mistake. Now, what big mistake was this? So I was in the eighth class. In the ninth class, I don't remember. And my parents came upstairs, and my uncle was visiting us from Bombay. And I got very excited. I said, Dekho ji, dekho, Saturn dekho. So my uncle said, Saturn kithe, Punjabi, where is Saturn? I said, Uthe, Uthe. And I took this torch and I started shining it in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very big torch. It had three batteries, very powerful torch. And I kept shining it. Uthe, Saturn, Uthe, Jupiter, you know, and, and like that. And before I knew it, the police had arrived. You know, that siren, <laughs> you know, the police came. And I said, they thought, show me on this house, there is a Pakistani spy. Are you shining, you know, periodically in the sky? Very <laughs> heavy. But luckily, my father was quite well known in that area, and he somehow then we beta hai, thora chal hai, lekin achha hai. Hi. So this is what happened, and 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 I really started enjoying stargazing. So this was at a kind of a very beautiful but romantic level, you know, uh, about the universe. And then another very important incident occurred, and that is my cousin brother, who was a navy man, a big tough guy. He came, he used to visit us periodically and he liked to write short stories and he found that I like science and he presented me a little book and after that we went for a walk and he told me, you know Varun, the solar system is just like the atom. In both cases there is a central nucleus and things move around. I, you know, I couldn't believe it, how can it be that the laws governing the very large are the same as the laws governing the extremely small. I mean, this for me was a fantastic revelation. Later I realized that both are governed by this one over R square law. And there is this huge, amazing unity that exists in nature. And, and I also realized that the, that the way to this unity is through the study of physics. So, after that, I became interested in physics. And I was still getting, uh, I could not get 60% right till the end. I was still getting 56, 55, like that, you know. But I started reading books. And one of my favorites was George Gammon. He wrote some terrific, uh, terrific books. One was Want to Be Infinity. All the kids here, please read it. It's still very topical. And the second was Great for the Universe. And I believe this book really inspired me all the way to become a cosmologist. And, and, but also at this time I started enjoying sports, rifle shooting, right? I love rifle shooting. In fact, I have a rifle at home, right? But how did I get interested in rifle shooting? Again, to blame is the same Indo-Pak war. Because, you know, the war started, the government said, okay, we need a civilian rifle training program. And the rifle training program was just behind my school. So it was free, right? And at uh, six, uh, five in the morning, I used to wake up, brush my teeth, eat an apple, walk five miles. And, and do rifle shooting. And I realized that I was very good at it. And I actually won many medals after that in the sport. I also started really enjoying music. I had a deep love of music, rock music, classical music, everything. My mother used to sing very beautifully. 
And so I think music and science nourish each other in my mind. And this has happened not only to me, but also to many other scientists. I mean, you know, Einstein played the violin, right? There is some kind of, uh, you know, symbi symbiosis that takes place, synthesis in the mind. And uh, remarkably, I started getting cleverer also because of this. <laughs> Actually, my, you know, I, my grades started improving. I could read maths books while lying in bed. You know, just I started enjoying algebra proofs, right? And I, I realized that I could do it all in my mind, right? And so everybody was astonished. My parents, my principal, when I finished school to the first division, a very high first, and got admission into St. Stephen's College. It was not easy then, and it is even harder now. And in college again, I joined the chess club, the rifle right club, played the guitar. I still play the guitar. And curiously, my lab partner, you know, we did experiments together. He played the flute. His so, name was Omar Ahmad Kareem. He is in the US now. And so after the lab classes, we used to come home and we used to rehearse. He used to play the flute. I used to play the guitar. He went to And I graduated from St. Stephen's with this Best All Rounder Award, which made me quite proud, but which also gave me um, you know, a conviction that you know you don't have to only do science to succeed, right? You can do science, do music, do literature, read, enjoy poetry, and still succeed. This was very important. Because I feel nowadays, you know, emphasis is so much on learning, right? So much on cramming, so much on mugging up, and you are made to feel from childhood that you have to do something from the house at 9 o'clock, you just do it at 9 o'clock in the morning, you just do it at 9 o'clock. <laughs> but this is wrong. This, this really it can have adverse, adverse. So have fun in science. But I hated the exam system. I still hate the exam system. I, I just could not tolerate it. So after three years in college, you know, it was this three hours, you know, you sit, you know, open the exam paper and teen ghanto me lichdo what you can do. I could not take this. So after BSc, most of my kid friends stayed on for MSc in, 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 in St. Stephen's. I said, I'm going to go And I realized that Moscow provided this opportunity. They had a very liberal exam system. So I moved to Moscow. Now, this is the Moscow State University. You can see how grand it is. It's very beautiful. Right? I lived in a room over there. This was a hospital. This was the hospital of Moscow State University. The center of the building was 55 stories high. This was the physics department. This was the chemistry department. It looked really beautiful, especially in summer and in winter. It looked like this. Snow all around. It was skating. Extremely cold. In 1979, I experienced minus 42 degrees Celsius. This was the coldest winter of my life. And I spent six hours of it outdoors. So I survived Moscow and I loved Moscow. And I met many good friends in Moscow. But my main influence was this person, Yakov Zeldovich. Now most of you will not have heard of him, but he was as as uh, deep, as great a scientist as Stephen Hawking or Richard Feynman. He was a completely remarkable individual. You see, he did major contributions all over physics, chemical physics, theory of shock waves, thermal explosions, flame propagation, combustion, nuclear physics, particle physics. And in the end of his career, when he was about 50, he moved to astrophysics and this point. Now, it's very rare in science that at 50, you make a career change. Because at 50, he was already so famous, he, had, he was a director of an institute, he could have just relaxed and done what he was comfortable with. He made a complete career change. In fact, Hawking greatly admired him. When he met him, I said, now I know you're a real person. Because earlier he thought he was a collection of people, all of whom were writing under this name. So, the Zobit was again remarkable in another way that he received no formal university education. He never went to college. Never. Okay. So, you know, he graduated from high school at the age of 15, after which he joined some place as a laboratory <coughs> system. And it, it is very interesting that, you know, a very famous scientist, he's in the 30s, right? Joffe, he came to this place, this, and, and he, you know, he was on the blackboard and he was addressing the seminar. And he said, you know, one unexplained problem of chemistry is this. And this young man, 15-year-old man at the back said, I know how to solve that. 
He said, how do you know? And he came to the blackboard and scribbled a few equations and he also said, this man is remarkable. Who is he? And he said, he is Yaakov Zodosh. And so, he all said, please, he went back to Moscow and said that, please release Zadovich to science, right? Don't keep him here. And it is rumored that Zadovich was treated for fuel pump. That means his uh, institute said, okay, we'll use Zadovich, but we need a fuel pump to give us fuel pump. Right? So, after that, Zadovich defended his PhD in 36, and years later, he remembered of the happy times and permission to defend a PhD was granted to people with no higher education. This is kind of very, very remarkable. Because of this, his entire style of doing science was very informal because he was self-taught. And when you are self-taught, you develop a total independence of thinking. You don't never follow anybody else. This again is completely missing in our education system. We are always taught, follow this guy, follow that person, follow this person. You are wrong, he is right, she is right. It's horrible. Zaldovich had none of that. And I was very, very lucky to work with him. So let me tell you my exam in cosmology. So what happened was that Zaldovich gave a course of lectures in, in Moscow State University, beautiful lectures on cosmology. And after that I said, well, you know, I want to give you an exam. And he said, all right. He was a very busy man. He didn't have much time for people. And he said, okay, you know, why don't you meet me in, in this room at this time? So I said, all right. And you know, I had to meet him all. And I worked very hard that whole night. Two nights I was just studying the whole syllabus again and again and again. And again. And I went there, and so though it, it was a corridor, beautiful big sofa, he came out of his office and he said, okay, Varun, here are two problems. And he wrote two problems on a piece of paper, solved them, and he left. And so I was sitting in this corridor looking at these two problems. You know, I had remembered the whole syllabus, the whole textbook very well, and I couldn't even think how to solve these problems. So I was quite depressed, I just got up and left. I left and I went back to my hostel and I looked at all the textbooks in cosmology and I realized that these problems had not been solved, ever. So, it took me six months to solve one problem. All right. It took me six months to solve one problem and after that, it was summer when he gave me the problem, it was winter, I went back to Zaldo. And, uh, you know, there was a queue. Uh, you know, Zaldo used to sit on this, uh, you know, after his lectures, he used to sit on a bench and many people, there was a whole queue of people wanting to talk to him. And before me, there was this uh, you know, very pompous, very big professor of physics, statistical physics. And so he said, Yaakov Borisovic, stop it, Yaakov Borisovic, I solved this very famous problem in statistical mechanics. And here is my paper. So Zaldovich said, all right. He was sitting there. This guy was sitting next to him. He said, all right, go to the blackboard, prove me what you have said. And so this guy got up, he, started, he went to the blackboard and started writing something and Zaldovich immediately caught him. He said, that is wrong. And you know, even to me, the student sitting there, we understood why he was wrong. Because Zaldovich put his finger right on the point. And this man, he was a big Russian, he was very fair and you know, I could see his skin getting red. This red color started rising on his face. He got very embarrassed. And he started saying, no, no, I, actually, and he started stuttering. Zaldovich said, it's over. Next, and next it was me. And I said, my God, this fellow has uh, almost demolished a full professor who is 50 something in, in two minutes. I am over for me, right? I am a lamb to the slaughter. And then, you know, I said, Higa, marna hai to mar hai. <laughs> and there was fate, right? So I went to him, and, and you know, he completely forgot about this man. I sat next to him, I said, you know, he gave me this problem six months ago, I've solved it. And he with great attention, he looked at it, and he said, wonderful, this is excellent. I'm giving you an A grade, and I want a paper. So, you know, I was thrilled, because this was my first paper, and I published it in an Indian journal, and this was even before I began my MSc. So this is how exams can be given sometimes. So after that, you know, in, in Moscow I met many famous scientists including Hawking and Chandrasekhar. And you know, the meeting with Chandrasekhar was especially moving for me because there were very few Indians in Moscow and Chandra was an outstanding scientist. This, this auditorium is was named after him. And Chandrasekhar loved beauty. He loved beauty in science. He, in fact, he gave a seminar in, in the Steinberg Institute in Moscow where he said that the most beautiful object in the universe is a black hole. Most aesthetically beautiful. 
because the black hole is perfect. And to give an example, he said, the other object that is beautiful is Michelangelo's sculpture. Because Michelangelo was a preeminent sculptor of his time. And he has written, he wrote many books and, and, and articles on this. He gave a talk in Ayuka also. And one of his famous books is on truth and beauty, aesthetics and science. So Chandrasekhar had a profound, his style of doing science, his, his maths had to be beautiful, his derivations had to be perfect, right? Oh, this really inspired me because it was completely different from the way the Russian approach to science was, which was very intuitive, very informal, it's a very formal approach. So after that, I kind of defended my PhD in Moscow. These are my two gurus, the lowest here, Sarabinsky. This man might win the Nobel Prize one day, so watch out. Very bright person. This is the only time in my life that I wore a suit, I, I should confess. And actually, they said, you know, if you have to defend a PhD in Moscow, you have to wear a suit. And I said, I don't have a suit. So the Russian students were very kind. And you know, before I knew it, three people had brought suits to my hostel room. But you know, Russians are big people. So their suits never really fitted me. So it had a, had a really tough a crisis in my life was finding a suit. And uh, of course, I, I defended successfully. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. And I wrote my PhD thesis in Russia. And, and you know, uh, so I was fluent in Russian. I spent eight and a half years in Moscow. But the next step was of my journey after my defense was to the West. And I did a postdoc to the UK and then in Canada. Now, it's quite interesting that, um, you know, sometimes in science, fear strikes you. You become very, very afraid. That time when I had to speak to Zadoj, I became suddenly very afraid, you know. And again, I became very afraid once more after that. You see, I went to England and uh, I was, you know, started writing papers with a very famous scientist who was a student of Stephen Hawking. And after we wrote this paper, you know, I guess people in Cambridge came to know what we were doing and they invited me to Cambridge to give a seminar. And I said, oh my God, I don't even know English very well because you see, this, 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 this scientist whom I was working with was British. And I didn't understand what he was saying because I was from Russia, right? I'd forgotten my whole physics vocabulary. It was all in Russian for me, you see. The derivative is called Prezvodnaya in Russian. Can you remember Prezvodnaya? That is derivative. But the remarkable thing here was that even though this gentleman, Ian Moss and I, you know, I could understand only half his words which he spoke. But when he wrote the blackboard, he has wrote everything. And that led me to believe that, you know, maths is the language of science. I may not know what you are saying. I mean, you may be talking in Japanese and I'm in English. But we can still write a paper together because I go to the blackboard and I write everything. It is completely clear what makes sense. That is a gift, actually. You know, you don't realize how important it is. And so, I went to, you know, I went to, uh, to, to you know, this place, the damp where he was. And that whole night I couldn't sleep because I had to get up very early, take a train to London, take another train to Cambridge. And, and I was telling my wife, I wish they hadn't invited me to the seminar. I mean, oh, I was very nervous. And you know, before the seminar, the British had a, had a way of, of making you relax. They give you a bit of sherry. You went to this room and you drank this beautiful liquor, sherry. And you made small talk. So one very famous scientist there said, you know, um, last week there was this famous uh, scientist who had come uh, from Edinburgh and he spoke on magnetic fields. And five minutes into his talk, Stephen said, oh, that cannot be right. And, and, and so he had made a mistake. And the seminar ended there. I said, what? <laughs> you know? I said, my God, what are you telling me? And he said, of course, oh, that will not happen to you. Drink up, drink up, drink up. <laughs> so of course, that scared me further. And, and again, just like it happened in Moscow, I said, okay, yaar, marna hai to mar do. Hamare hai to mar hone, hain? Jo hoga so hoga dekhi jayega. So I went to the seminar room and, you know, they were like, it was just Stephen Hawking's group, right? Very clever people, 30 of them, right, sitting there. And I started talking. And about five minutes into my seminar, I heard the sound. Very faint. It grew louder. feel the tension in this auditorium. Very real tension began in this auditorium. And at the loudest, the, the door in the back opened and Hawking came in. And Hawking came in and just like this and, and he 
he, he stopped right here, like he stopped like seven feet from me. And I had to pretend that I, 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 I it's just nothing is happening. I kept on speaking. And of course, something was happening. My heart was pounding very, very <laughs> rapidly, right? And then I heard, you know, I was turned to the blackboard and I heard this sound. The strong, the scale of feel does not satisfy the strong energy condition. Beep. What happened? I turned around. And then I realized that he could not speak, of course, because he was speaking through his computer, right? So I couldn't get the question. I said, could you please repeat it? And he repeated this. He repeated this. He repeated this question. Can I out of it? He repeated this question and I could answer it luckily. So I survived and after that it was fantastic. I mean I was put up in Trinity College in, in Cambridge and I was looked after very well. So I think this was a big milestone <laughs> in my life. And after that I spent five years abroad and I returned to India after 14 years abroad and joined groups. Mayuka almost exactly 24 years ago. Now Ayuka in those days was not like Ayuka now. There was this Aditi Bango next door which is still there. And they were donkeys. There were many, many, many donkeys. <laughs> I don't get the photo of the precise donkey was wandering there, so I picked out the way. Now, it's very interesting. You see, my wife is Maharashtrian and she's from Bombay. And I'm from Delhi. So she came to Ayuka first. And I was very excited, you know, very uh, patriotism. I was very excited about the Ayuka. And I asked her, how is it long distance boat? How is Ayuka? And she just didn't say anything. I told her, Kush to bolo, kasa laga aapko ayuka? She said, Peed bade khub surat hai. Aur bhoat saare gadhe bhi ghoom rahe hai. So by gadha, I hope she did not mean faculty members. It seems they were real donkeys. And, and, and when, I, you know, when, I, when I came to Ayuka after that, a few days later, I found there were many, many, many donkeys, ghade bhi thi, sheep bhi thi, you know. There was grazing land for the university and there was building work going on. So the donkeys were actually sometimes carrying building work. And everybody, all of us were crammed into this little shed called Aditi. All the scientists, all the administration, everybody. So, I, of course, I was very excited. We come from Canada, right? From cold climate, it was warm here. And the first person who invited me for tea was, uh, you know, Professor uh, Nabi, right? You know, now I had met Jayant uh, in Bombay before that and also in England. And he was, you know, not, not, not very fat, but not very thin either. And this time when he invited me to tea, I could not believe my eyes because he was, he was famished, he was a skeleton. And he said, I know, and they were still very gracious, Mangala and him, you know, we sat nicely, our, our son was three years old at that time. I said, Aapko kya hua? And you know what had happened? He had been very ill. And why had he been very ill? Because you see, at that time, the first buildings in Ayuka after Aditi were not this complex where you are roaming around now. This complex came later. Jain said we must try to attract the best faculty. So give them housing first. So pahle Ayuka mein ghar bane the. And the first house that was made was one of the, the director's house. And he moved in. Now, a clever director, clever in, in an inverted sense, would have said, Nahi ji, pahle aap jaiye, phir hum halat thik ho jayenge, sudhrenge, to hum jayenge. But Jain was actually a general, but he behaved like a soldier. He said, Pahle, main ja kar rahunga, dekhenge kya hota. And promptly he drank water, water was infected, he got liver infection. Right? And so when I met him, he was just a caricature of himself. He had lost, I think, 15 kilograms. He was very poor health. Mujhe actually ghabraar ho gaya unko But I admired him greatly for what he was doing. Now, you see, we moved in and uh, after 14 years abroad, we found that gas is not there. Gas was not there. Why did you wait for 7 years? <laughs> so actually, my, my wife was very brave and she said, khana to khana hai. And she started cooking on kerosene stove. Now, now remember, we had come back from Toronto and we were used to pipe gas. And from pipe gas to come back and cook on kerosene stove is not easy. And we cooked on kerosene stove for many months. And one day, my wife got very badly burned. Her whole hand got burned. And the next day, a giant saw her with this bandage. And he said, what happened? And she said, well, I was cooking on the kerosene stove. And she said, why are you cooking on kerosene stove? She said, I don't have gas. And he was, he was very upset. He said, you should have told me earlier that you don't have gas. I said, you have so many other problems to deal with in Ayuka. This is a mamuli problem. 
but he immediately uh, made amends. He wrote a letter to the gas person, Bharat uh, Gas, and uh, a week later, two weeks later, we got a cylinder. And and so it was sort of you know early years of Ayuka. We were building the institute, you know, and there were many difficulties we faced. So once the roof fell in, in our house, my wife just uh, narrowly survived. You see, that time. And also, it was I was a faculty member, but most of the problems were faced by the students also. Now, in those days, in fact, I had this student. She's now a professor here. She was my first PhD student. And what happened there was that the students nowadays, you know, they have one or two students in a room. In those days, they were crammed. There were four students in a room, and outside was a telephone exchange. exchange. So all the time, there were people either walking in and out or somebody phoning somebody. Constant distractions, and yet these four kids had to do their PhD. And our pumpkin is like this one. Right? The first fan started uh, being installed when I had just joined. But notwithstanding, there was a big discovery in you know Kobe satellite discovered fluctuations from the Big Bang. I told him, well, perhaps around this could be from gravity waves. He wrote a very nice paper together. It became a famous paper, and that kind of launched his career in science. And I think Sanjeev Mitra did his PhD under him, so he's like my grand student. And, and so, you know, in the tough days of Ayuka, some very beautiful work came out also. Just when the buildings were being made. Now, uh, after that, I started thinking about well. How did galaxies form? Right? What what is the process? This you know we were thinking of serious science questions. How did galaxies form? And the answer was that well you know from this experiment in 1992 we realized that the universe was very very featureless. There was very small fluctuations in the density, one part in hundred thousand. And later these fluctuations in density grew 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 to form this cosmic web. And the way they grew was like this. This is a simulation of the universe. It's actually done on computer, but you can see that the universe starts here very featureless, and gradually these big structures form. And these structures are known as cosmic web. Cosmic web is evocative. It's as if you know you see the web a spider makes, right? And imagine there's a web like this on the cosmos. Only the dots in the web are galaxies. So galaxies in the universe. I uh, don't uh, not thrown randomly in space, but they form this big web, giant web. So this is a picture of that, and in fact, you know, this is the year International Year of Light, and the dots are shown much earlier. That the way the web forms in the sky or the galaxies or the gravity is just the way that light forms these caustics in the swimming pool. So most of you, all of you, must have seen this, right? In swimming pools, you know, you know, light always does this, right? But nobody realizes that gravity does this also, right? So again, this is a this is a meeting point of very dissimilar phenomena. Just like I told you, you know, electromagnetism also has one over r squared law, just like gravity, which is amazing. Again, gravity has another commonality with optics also that it can funnel things into caustics, just like light does. So exactly like this, you see, you know, regions where light is bright. You see regions where matter is dense in the in the sky. And in fact, this 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 field fascinated me enormously. And I realized now that the universe, uh, the concentration of galaxies in the universe, is not random. You know, you 50 years ago people thought you can ask what is the concentration of stars. Now it is not random. Stars are located in something called a galaxy, right? There's a lot of matter in a galaxy, and this galaxy is flat, you know, like a chapati, right? Okay. So similarly, uh, the, the galaxies in the sky are distributed on this enormous supercluster. This is a, each dot here. Remember, is a galaxy. So imagine the scale of this object. This is the largest object in the universe. It is about one billion light years in, in size. From here to here, it is about one billion light years. So imagine that light. You know the distance to a star is about a light year. It is a billion times larger than the distance to a star. So I started working on this, and, and I discovered some. And there are also regions here where there is no galaxies. These are called voids. There is absolutely nothing there. So the whole universe, if you want to imagine it, consists of galaxies sitting either on superclusters or missing places completely called voids. Now 
I was very lucky. In 2000, I was awarded the Bhatnagar Award from the Prime Minister Vajpayee. And I kind of enjoyed that very much because actually Vajpayee had been a poet and my own father was a writer. So I kind of, you know, I, I like that coincidence. After that, I started working on dark energy and extra dimensions. And you know, one of the big surprises, how many of you have heard of dark energy? Oh, many people have. Dark matter also. Good, 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 good. So you know, one of the surprises, uh, you know, of dark energy, it's, it's amazing that, you know, everything that we are made up of, you, me, your brother, sister, mother, father, chairs in this auditorium, the sun, the stars, anything you can think of, distant stars, galaxies, cosmic web, is only 4% of the universe. 4%. Right? Most of the universe is built of, most of the universe built of matter that just does not shine. Right? We know it is there, it does not shine. And so we divide it further, we call it dark matter. Dark matter is that which, you know, gravitates into our galaxy and we call it dark energy. And so this is the energy budget. You know, 73% of the universe consists of dark energy, 23% of dark matter and 4% only normal matter. Right? So this is remarkable that most of the universe is in a form we just don't understand. And being a scientist, being a theorist, I thought, let me think about this. Way. So dark energy is different from dark matter. Dark matter is believed not to have pressure at all. Dark energy is believed to have negative pressure. Right? Now negative pressure is very funny because you know in your pressure cooker, and pressure is always positive, isn't it? You know, you can imagine positive pressure. You blow a balloon, pressure is positive. In the sun, pressure is positive, right? But dark energy requires negative pressure. And the reason for that is from here. You all know this law, minus GM over R squared, you must be knowing acceleration, right? Acceleration on a, of, 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 of an object uh, to a, another mass called M is just minus GM over R squared, inverse square law. Now usually mass is positive, so acceleration is negative because of this minus sign. So what you get is that this body is being pulled somewhere inside here. Right? It's being pulled towards this mass. Now what happens is that Einstein changed this formula. Right? This formula was changed by Einstein and the simple change was that he redefined mass instead of just density times volume. Right? Normal definition of mass is density times volume. He changes to density plus three times of pressure. Now this change is remarkable because when I put it there, the mass can become negative if the pressure, if this quantity rho plus 3p is negative, the mass becomes negative, minus minus cancel and the acceleration becomes positive. So in this case, the mass instead of falling into this object will actually away will be anti -gravity. It's just like anti okay. So this is the way dark energy works. Dark energy is believed to have negative pressure which makes the universe accelerate instead of decelerate. So this is what the universe looks like. Wow. You know, it's accelerating faster and faster now. There's some stars, galaxies, and it all began, we believe, from inflation at the Big Bang. So one of my other interests is extra dimensions. What are extra dimensions? You know, we work, we live in three dimensions, right? Length, breadth, height, okay. These are three dimensions, right? Three dimensions of space. What is an extra dimension? Now, I'll give you an example of this sheet of paper. This is, how many dimensions has this got? Two. Two, all right? Now, let me call it up, right? It's still got two dimensions, right? Yeah. But now let me curl it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. I can't do it physically. But imagine I curl it smaller and smaller till this thickness becomes less than my hair. <laughs> then this paper becomes effectively one dimension. Right. So viewing this paper, if I curl it up tighter and tighter, tighter and tighter, I hide this extra dimension by curling this space up. And these are very important theories because it is believed that the universe actually has more than four dimensions. It might have ten dimensions. Super string theories believe the universe has ten dimensions. So I was fascinated by this idea of the universe having more than 
four dimensions. I mean, three dimensions at one time. Right? In this way, the universe may have four dimensions, so five dimensions total. Right? And so I was playing with the equations, and I discovered a very remarkable thing, and that is that you know the Big Bang, which starts from this singularity, can be prevented if our universe has extra dimensions. And how can this happen? Let me just go through these equations. They're very similar. You heard of Hubble's law? Yeah. So B is the recession velocity of galaxies. Any two galaxies, they recede by something that proportional to the distance between them. H is something not known as Hubble's constant. And this equation, H square is equal to rho, relates the density in matter to the expansion of the universe. Now clearly, in the past, the density was more and more and more, right? It's a row, the density went higher, and this means that the expansion rate went larger. So in Einstein's theory, there's a big problem in a sense that this row actually can go to infinity, which means the expansion rate can go to the infinity, which means the universe began in a singularity, began from a point. Now, in, 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 in extra dimensions, it turns out that this rho is replaced by a minus quantity. So as rho goes up, the stage is reached when rho is compensated by rho square. It obviously can't drop lower than that, right? Because the right hand side cannot be negative. And at that point, h goes to zero. And so there is no singularity. There is a big bounce. So the universe, the whole universe is different now. It starts from a bounce, expands, goes back into a bounce. So it becomes a cyclic universe in that sense. So I wrote this with my good friend Yuri Shtano. And the wonderful thing about Ayuka is that many people visit here. We have about 400 serious visitors a year. And Yuri is from Ukraine, from the Kiev. And he just loves Ayuka. And he's been visiting me for 15 years. And here it is, we are playing Holi together, right? Having a bit of, you know what? And we have written over a dozen papers. So, uh, you know, I think, I think one of the main things about science, which I find rewarding, are the very ma many friendships that you make along the road. Right? You know, you meet people, you share your ideas, you give something to them, they, they give something to you, right? And this really enriches your life. This really enriches my life. And uh, you see, the reason is the following, that you may work very hard on your paper, but you never know how the community will react to it. Maybe some people will like it, maybe they don't. But if you share your ideas with somebody else, and you know, if you, if you enjoy meeting somebody, that, that kind of friendship, that love, that stays for your whole life. So science has been very rewarding for me for the reason of the joy of sharing. And also science is a way of seeing things, you see. Anuradha mentioned how important science is at its a career. But I also know many cases where people took science and then left it and did something else. And an example here is, you know, this person who you find very funny picture. He's obviously not an Indian, because this big beard. He's also got this thing hanging around his neck. And the reason is that he's a very senior bishop in a church. So why am I showing this picture? And the reason is the following, that we met when he was 22 and I was 25 in Moscow. He was doing science and I was doing science. But this guy, we used to call him Pata, was very interested in cinema. So every now and then he used to come to my room in the hospital and say, hey, and you again working. Let's go see this beautiful movie together. I said, who's the director? He said, Satyajit Ray. So he actually introduced me to the best cinema in the world. He used to take us in the winter, show us really good cinema. I really appreciated this man. Then in 85, I left Moscow. He went away to Georgia. He lost touch. You know, 20 years later, a lady contacts me on Facebook and says, are you the same Varun Sahani who studied in Moscow in 85? I said, yes, I am. You know, he said, my father wants to talk to you. And so this man rings me up and says, Varun, I'm missing you, my dear friend. Come to me, come to Georgia. So last summer, my wife and I went there. My wife, incidentally, I met in Moscow. You know, we were like girlfriend, boyfriend at that time. <laughs> and so we went to Georgia, and I, I learned about this very extraordinary life of this guy. You see, after finishing MSc in physics, he was a very bright physicist. He realized that his main uh, urge in life was to make cinema, movies. So he, he joined the Cinema Institute, Film Institute, and finished a, a course in, in direction, made some movies. And at around that time, he started thinking, well, you know, he started getting interested in, in religious, spiritual issues. And, and he said, no, I am meant for a life in the church. 
Now, you know, I met his mother who was 85 and she said when she heard this, she was very angry. She said, you get out of my house. <laughs> you get out of my house because my your father and I have financed you for 10 years, first through science, then through, <laughs> then through cinema, and now you want to go to church. You know how poor they are there? And he had a wife and three children. So she said, all of you get out. <laughs> but then the next day she said, no. No, no, you wife and three children can stay, not their fault. You are in India, you leave. <laughs> so, I don't know what happened there. Maybe he left. But you know, he was very gifted in, in, in religion. You see, he, 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 he just was passionate about, about spiritual matters. And he was by that time quite, quite mature. And he became very famous. He became extremely famous. And he got promoted in the hierarchy very rapidly in Georgia. So when we had to meet him in summer, he was a very honored guru in Georgia, right? a bishop, right? And he met me and everywhere we were walking together on the street, people used to go to him and say, good morning, bishop, can we do this, help you and in some way? And his mother was very happy because, her father, because of her, his, her famous son, you know, the family was blessed, right? And, and I realized how strange it is. And when we met together, you know, I visited him for a week in the morning, you know, uh, he used to, we used to meet together and he said, do you remember that lovely lecture on quantum mechanics? <laughs> I said, of course, you know, we had a lovely fa favorite teacher in quantum mechanics. And he asked the same profound questions that time as we used to discuss in our 20s. So the passion for science had not left him. But that passion, that great curiosity that science had taught him, he, you know, remained with him as a bishop. And in his parish, you know, uh, which is away from the BBC, uh, he had made a beautiful movie hall and where, where you know he used to show the world's best cinema including his own movies to people who came and, and he said you know why don't please come back and give 10 lectures on Big Bang model <laughs> to my to my disciples so I realized you know that uh, this journey did not go waste you see from the outside you might have think what is this boy he's not making up his mind but he made up his mind in a very profound way. So sometimes what we want to be does not occur to us at the age of 10 or 15 or 20 or even 30. Maybe it comes to us when we're 40, 45. Right? So don't be in a hurry to find out who you are. Maybe you're not an engineer, maybe you're not a doctor, maybe you're not a scientist. Who knows who you are? This should be the central question of your inner world. Who am I? What am I here for? must be a reason I'm here, right? Okay. I could have been a lizard, a monkey, a whale. None of them ask these questions. But we can ask these questions. Who am I? What am I here for? And so, I realized, and again, like Anurada said, that imagination is really important. My friend had profound imagination. Imagination leads you to explore things. It leads you to read books, see good movies, you know, have deep conversations with your friends, right? You know, imagination is beautiful and it be, helps you lead, uh, explore different paths. And uh, having come to the end of my talk, I'll again uh, come to the beginning because, you know, I, I think the way I am was partly, partly influenced by my family. And my grandfather was a businessman in Rawalpindi and after partition, you know, his business just collapsed, he moved to Delhi. Uh, but his two sons, my uncle became an actor. Maybe some of you have seen his movies, Kabli Bala and Wak. You know, uh, so I enjoyed. I saw Wak with him actually. I was 10 years old. I cried a lot. <laughs> and my father was a writer. Uh, he wrote a famous novel called Thomas. Maybe some people who are old here may remember that. Yes, some nodding of heads. Some people do. My, my spouse is the head of the economics department in the University of Pune, and she loves economics. But when our son became, uh, you know, 18, 19, he did zoology from, from Ferguson College and he got a distinction and he said, Dad, Mom, this is it, it's over, no science for me, no economics for me, I want to be a musician. <laughs> you know? So I said, wow, oh, okay, it's a full circle, right, from businessman to scientist to writer, actor, musician. Okay, do what you want, right, be a musician. And he's recording today, he was recording yesterday and, and he just loves what he does, right. And, and we really enjoy it hearing his guitar and you know he's on YouTube you can go and explore his name on YouTube I've also got a music thing on YouTube all the way it's there see Varun Sahani type on YouTube <laughs> I've got a song on Ayuka performed here <laughs> one of my students PhD students he's a prof in ISE Bangalore Tarun Sahani he plays beautiful guitar 
So you know, when we were doing PhD together, we did some very really nice papers. But in the spare time, we sit and and sing songs. Right? And I remember the songs more than the papers. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you remember music more than you remember science, isn't it? Music is wonderful. So on this happy note, uh, I would like to say thank you. Everybody.